thank you. Um, I'm from an organisation called Defend the Right to Protest. Uh, our campaign started in 2010 when uh, the student tuition fee demonstrations were kicking off uh, and we saw the first major protests against the uh, then Conservative Lib Dem government uh, and the cuts that they were trying to implement uh, and the neoliberal economic uh, change that they uh, were trying to foster in the economy. The student protests saw huge amounts of violent repression from the police, including their favourite tactic of kettling students. Um, but what we, what we also saw was a complete um, misuse of police weaponry, including batons, uh, the weaponization of horses. Some of you might remember the, um, the uh, charge uh, not far from here in Westminster, um, what, Parliament Square, uh, the, ch the char charge of horses. And that, that, that image is one that kind of uh, harked back to the, the poll tax riots and really set the tone for how uh, protests would come to be repressed uh, over the next six years it is now. Um, the, our campaign was also involved in stopping uh, or trying to stop Boris Johnson from acquiring those water cannons uh, that he bought and then was told by Theresa May that he couldn't use. Um, but what, one of the important things, and Alfie Meadows, whose mother, uh, whose mother spoke, Alfie Meadows being the student who was battened over the head by a police officer and very nearly killed at the uh, December 9th to, uh, 2010 student demonstration, one of the points that his mother made was, when we saw those horses being used as a weapon against the students, if water cannon had been available, uh, we, can very, we can very much imagine how much more chaos would have been caused by those horses being uh, s swapped out for a water cannon. We've seen the kind of effects that water cannon can have on, uh, on members of the public that uh, fa face it over, in the uh, over on the continent in countries like Germany. Um, one gentleman was completely blinded by the use of the exact same water cannons that Boris Johnson uh, bought for use here in the UK. Um, so the one of the questions that we have to ask ourselves is why why do we need um, an increasingly militarized police force? This is something that's happening not only here in the UK but uh, it's very evident in the US. Um, and as the and as the police get more and more geared up uh, to uh, to to fight disorder, as they like to put it, often the uh, the what they're actually fighting is a democratic expression of people's freedom, uh, freedom of speech, and freedom, freedom to protest against the the violent cuts that we see, um, the violent um, the the violent tactics the state uses to quell disorder um, within its bounds. The Black Lives Matter movement over in the U.S. has been making. Um, important points about the militarization of the police, which I'm glad to see that we're also doing here at a demonstration like this today. Uh, they, they do this not, uh, um, not only because of the repression that the pr protesters face on the streets with regards to police officers who, who are increasingly tooled up, but also because even in day-to-day -day interactions with the police, we see how these weapons can go seriously wrong and end up um, leaving people often dead or seriously harmed. Uh, we've got to remember people like um, Jimmy Mbenga, who not, uh, wasn't killed by police, but was killed by uh, incre the increasingly privatized arm of policing in this country. It was uh, the outsourced G4S deportation um, services that the Home Office employs that killed Jimmy Mbenga in their um, in their restraint procedures. And we've also had a case recently in Combrook Detention Center where someone using one of the restraint belts on a, um, a one of the restraint belts that they probably are viewing at their um, arms fair this week was used on a detainee and they ended up dead. Um, so even those, uh, even those uh, 
instruments that they're purchasing that they suggest are merely for safety and for restraint are lethal. Uh, and we've got, to, uh, we've got to bear that in mind. Um, just on the point of um, the export and the economy of these things, uh, some of you might have seen today in the uh, Guardian newspaper, Helen Steele's in, uh, incredibly brave uh, and powerful, um, I don't know what to call it, her, her, her confrontation of a, a police officer that spied on, spied on her and had a relationship with her whilst he was undercover for many years. Uh, and this, uh, this officer was actually um, flying back from India to Sydney where he is now part of a private kind of police um, uh, training um, company but flying back from India where he was um, speaking, about, uh, speaking about and trying to sell and training people in various tactics of how to uh, deal with dissent, how, um, how the police deal with disorder, which means the UK and the behavior of the, those officers in the special demonstration squad, which uh, is no doubt continuing to this day, uh, are being sold around the globe as good practice. Um, <laughs> So I, I'm, I'm very glad that Defend Rights Protest was invited here today to speak out against this economy, to say that uh, we don't need an increasingly militarized police, that, the, um, that the, uh, we've got enough evidence to say that um, policing is far overstretching its powers and we don't need to give that power any more weaponry to cause harm on our streets. So thank you very much for the invitation. Solidarity to everyone who's... Uh, uh, facing down this um, um, horrible militarized policing um, economy that's be being developed as global, and global expressions of protest come to the fore. So thank you, Whale, for that, uh, for that, that moving speech. Um, one of the things Whale just talked about was the police and the security services taking powers that they don't deserve, that uh, they use for repression. We'd like to hear now from Kerry. Kerry, would you like to come and share some, some of your experiences of uh, police repression? Uh, so Kerry, if you'd like to sort of introduce yourself and say, uh, and say your experiences. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me here. Um, my name is Kerry Bullivan and I was held um, on, on, under house arrest for two years, um, six months of which in a high security Belmarsh prison on the basis of secret courts and secret evidence. This didn't happen in a third world country, it didn't happen in Burma where we hear about house arrests all the time, it happened here in the UK. And to this day, even though I was found innocent, I still don't know what I was accused of. To this day, I still haven't been able to see any evidence brought against me. For two years, I had no uh, way to access any justice because of laws that were, the, that were brought in by um, the, the, the Labour government and supported by the, the Tory government. This is actually the, the building from which that um, control order was administered. A control order that said that I wasn't allowed to sign on at the police station right next to my house that I had to travel 50 minutes to a 24-hour police station even though I was only allowed to sign on for a one-hour uh, window. It was from this office that they engineered this control order, which does exactly what it says on the tin. It controls every single aspect of your life. It blocks any way of getting education, any way of working, any way of continuing with your life, and all on the basis of secret courts and secret evidence. We found out through our own investigation some of the evidence against me and it was a drunken phone call that a friend of my mother's had made to the anti-terror hotline that why, why would my friend's son become Muslim? Why would he do that? He must have been brainwashed by Al-Qaeda. And when we finally got our day in court and we weren't allowed, we were excluded, myself and my lawyers, from 90% of the hearings, we were only allowed in for a tiny part and the, the time when we brought our case, we, we got the police officers up there, we got the security services up there and we said to them, did you do any checks on this person and why they made this accusation? Did you do any checks on why they made these claims? 
No, they'd done none. They didn't check who she was. They didn't check why she'd made these accusations. And they didn't check what the, what the background and the basis was. They'd just taken this anonymous phone call as verbatim proof against me and ruined two years of my life on the basis of secret courts and secret evidence. And I was so glad to hear the, the previous speaker talking about Black Lives Matters because there's an intersectionality here between the, the plight of people who have been racistly abused by the police in this country for many, many years, uh, going right back to the 80s and the, and, and the demonization of young black men and the, the treatment of black people in, in America, and now the treatment of Muslims here in the UK now. And to be Muslim is the new black in many ways in regards to the way that the, the police use overly heavy-handed heavy measures that they're, they're using this as a scapegoat to bring in new powers and to always be asking for more and more and more. And that's fundamentally undermining our rights and our freedoms in this uh, society. Now we have the, the introduction of PREVENT. This is the last thing I thought I won't go into. Now we have the introduction of PREVENT. PREVENT which looks to police how we raise our children and police our, our, our children's thoughts and is already being used, again, in secret courts and secret evidence, something that they said would only be used in terrorism cases, now being used to take children away from families. In the last, in, in the last quarter of, of last year, um, the organization I work with dealt with 15 cases of children being taken away from their families purely because of the religious or political beliefs of the family. And we've seen in high-profile cases in, in the news and on TV um, and in the papers such as the, uh, I grew up in a terrorist house. The boy who misspelt the word terrorist house and, and, and was uh, reported to the police, the police came and raided the house, took their, their computers, uh, just on the basis of, of, of a misspelling of a, of a uh, 10 year old. We've got a 14 year old who was uh, reported to the police and questioned about their views on Israel and Palestine because they supported Greenpeace and, and anti whaling campaigns. They said that blocking the boats and ramming the boats that were killing the whales is, is really good. It's like a form of eco-terrorism. And that was enough to, to, to have them reported to the police. This is the world that we're starting to live in. And this is where we need to unite all communities and all different backgrounds to stand firm and say that, no, you don't have the right to police our thoughts. And I'll be honest, not all of the police officers want to do this. Even Charles Farr, one of the senior police officers in the Met, has said it shouldn't be our job to be thought police. Well, they need to act upon that and not just say it. They need to refuse to be thought police. Thank you very much. Thank you. Amazing talk. Thank you. Okay, we're, we're coming closer to our vigil, but I think we've got one last speaker. Issa, would you like to say some words? Uh, some of you may recognise these stuff, Asa, from the, the posters that have appeared mysteriously around London. So, uh, yeah, you may want to come a bit closer as well, so that when we go to move to the vigil, we can we can be together. So, please do come closer. We only have a a small PA, so please come closer, Asa. Hi all. Hi all. I am a victim of torture. My home of Bahrain is a country which Britain supports and sells arms to and which has used this arm against the, Bah uh, the Bahraini people. Britain has supported this dictator against the Bahraini people who called for freedom, democracy and the human rights. In 2011, the Bahraini people were protesting at Lula Arandabot, demanding their rights. The Bahraini government responded with the force they attacked the Lula around the boat in the middle of the night. Four were killed and countless were injured. Weeks later, the Saudi army entered. They, they are also armed by Britain and they held Christ, Christ, the movement for democracy. Many people were killed, beaten, arrested and tortured. In, two, in 2013, in 2013, I was arrested at the protest. A police is starting to follow me and they track me down. The two cars chased me down the street. I was extremely scared and I knew I had to get away. They were driving extremely fast. If, if they were trying, trying to crush me with their car, a police officer, the police officer ran up behind me, jumped in my back and beat me down. I was very scared. A police officer I put a gun against my, against my head. 
and said to me, do you want me to kill you? I was thrown into the car. They used my t-shirt to cover my face. I had no idea where they were taking me. I was finally able to see where I was. I was in a dark open area. Four officers were inside the car with me. One of the officers accused me of starting a fire and throwing Molotov cocktails. They asked me who I knew, trying to find out information. I told him I didn't do anything wrong. He said if, that, if, I, I, give, if I give him information, he will let me go. I replied that I don't know what you are talking about. Then they punched me in the face and hit me with their gun and helmets. They, th they threatened me to hurt me more when I refused to speak. One of officers removed my clothes and put a knife against my penis. They turned my face to the back of the car. I couldn't see anything. They told me they were going to cut my penis if I didn't give him the information. I told him again. I didn't, I didn't know what you are talking about. They pressed the knife against me. And for a moment, I thought they, they had cut it. The police started beating me and torturing me. By this point, I was extremely painful, and I was close to feeling down. They questioned me more, but I was so, I was so be, but I was so beaten. I could not speak, so they tortured me again. After that, I was taken to the police station. I was in so much pain that I was unable to walk, eat, or sleep. They refused to let me see a doctor or I take a shower. I was there for a week, unable to speak with my family also. I was finally released three months later. I was outside of a prison, but I was not free. I was arrested two more times after that and, uh, and arrested each time and released each time. Each time they tortured me. They, can, they can take me outside the detention, telling me that I had to give him information or they, will, they, or they will kill me. I was very scared. I was very scared that if I stayed longer, they will find me again, torture me or kill me. Because of that, I leave Bahrain and I came for UK and I climbed, for, I climbed asylum seats. I saw this and torture with my own eye. My family and my people are stealing in danger today. The UK is a major support of Bahraini regime and its arms sells in one of the major ways. It's proof, it provides sub, this support. But by doing so, the UK helps to destroy Bahraini lives. We are here to say that arms sales help bring death and torture. That money is covered in the, in the blood of Bahraini people. That is, that is why we must always stand up for democracy and in end to the arms sales. Thank you for your listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Issa. Again, not easy to, to sort of share these stories, so much, much appreciated. So, what's going to happen now? In a moment, we'll, we'll move towards the vigil. After that, we'll have a sharing of names. And then, I'm also aware that people would like to know what to do as a next step. Uh, and so there are people from different campaigns who perhaps would like to share some of the actions coming up, maybe. And also, don't forget, we have a, a board to sign up on as well. So if we can do it in that order, uh, a kind of the vigil, the names, and then uh, shares and, and shout-outs and next steps, if that's all right. Okay, so can I ask you to come closer to the, to the candles here? Can we, can we kind of uh, come, come to this place? And if we could be still for a moment and just think for a moment about those people who are experiencing police repression, torture, and the families of, of, of those who, who have experienced that. And I'd like us to, to pause for a minute just to remember them and to think of them in solidarity. So, for a minute.
All right, thank you. We ask people to come with photographs and, and, and names in their minds. If you have a photograph and it's not already here, please, please bring it up. And if you have a name that you would like to mention, start to think of it now. I have a few names to, to start us off, and maybe we can, we can help to remember this. We'd like to remember Sarah Reed, who died recently in Holloway. We'd like to remember Jimmy Mabenga, who we've spoken about today. We'd like to remember Ian Tomlinson, who was a casualty of police violence. And I'd like to remember Smiley Culture, who died during a mysterious arrest in his kitchen in London. Does anybody else have any names they would like to recall? Brian Hoare. We'd like to remember Brian Hoare, who spent long hours outside of Parliament. He drove him mad. Well, he, he certainly, yeah, he certainly didn't, didn't do him any good. But he resisted all the way through. Sean Riggs. Sean Riggs, Leon Patterson. Sean Riggs, Leon Patterson. Feel free, feel, feel free to come up and take the mic if there's a name that you think of. There's, uh, there's a very long list, unfortunately, of people who've died in police custody. Um, Ian Tomlinson's family were people that I got to know very well after his death. There's a small group of us who use some of our experiences to try and support that family. And of course, they didn't get any justice, which is something which is true for, for so many families who have lost loved ones because of the actions of the police. Um, for 10 years, uh, myself and others organised a regular march from Trafalgar Square to, uh, to Downing Street to hand in a letter to whatever Prime Minister happened to be in number 10. Uh, and it was a very painful uh, uh, experience every time we did that. And in the end, I just had to back away from it. It was just too much. It is something that continues. But some of the names of some of the people that, um, that I wanted to mention were, um, were Mark Duggan, uh, who was shot by the police, um, and Anthony Granger, who was shot by the police, uh, in uh, in Manchester, um, uh, Jean Charles de Menezes, another uh, another very famous name, and another campaign that I was very heavily involved in, who died in 2005. Um, Zell Rodney, whose mum is a very good friend of mine, uh, again another shooting. Um, oh, what else do we have here? Harry Stanley, regrettably another shooting, a guy who was shot because the police mis mistook the table leg that he was carrying for a gun. Nobody was ever prosecuted for that, and he died in 1999. Uh, Christopher Alder, uh, which is probably one of the first people, Janet Alder is still campaigning for justice for her brother. Christopher died on the 1st of April 1998, a very long time ago. Um, there's uh, James Brady, Richard O'Brien, Cynthia Jarrett, of course, many people will remember that, and, and uh, uh, Dorothy Gross. Uh, and then going back even further, the death of Blair Peach. Uh, Blair Peach died on 24th of April 1979. One of the things about the, the, this huge litany of deaths is that there isn't um, any justice, there isn't people who go to police officers who go to prison. There is a court case at the moment, and I think this may be a turning point, we are keeping our fingers crossed, but there's a court case involving um, the death of somebody called uh, Thomas Orchard, um, which is a shocking case. Uh, three officers are currently facing uh, manslaughter charges and that, that, the outcome of that is imminent. That could well be the first uh, successful prosecution for death in police custody, but I kind of feel like I've said that before and that you kind of think, you know, when is this ever going to happen? Is there going to be an opportunity for, for our family to finally some, see some form of justice at some point? I hand over to somebody else if they want to say some of the names. Hilda Morrell. Hilda Morrell. Hilda Morrell is the name? Heard about a secret service. I don't have their names, but over 3,000 people in Yemen who have been killed by British weapons, um, one of which is companies BA Systems is exhibiting this week, so I'd like to remember them.
I'd like to mention a couple of Palestinian prisoners that I know personally. Uh, they're amongst the hundreds of Palestinian prisoners held without even trial or charge, uh, sometimes for months or years. Um, my friend Hassan Najjar from the village of Burin has been in prison uh, about nine months now. No charge, no trial. Uh, my friend Wael Faki from Nablus, also in prison, no trial, no charge, um, about four months now. And I have some personal experience. I have the dubious honor of having been inside an Israeli prison and having been handcuffed and shackled with equipment branded made in England. And it didn't make me proud. It didn't make me proud at all. And we should not be supplying security equipment to regimes like the Israeli regime, like the Saudis, like the Bahraini regime, like the Qatari regime. Thank you. And to say, those, those regimes are in town this week. They're all here buying weapons. Any more names? Um, I would like to mention the name of Julio Cesar Mondragón, Daniel Solis Gallardo, Julio Cesar Ramirez Nava, who are students uh, from uh, Yotzinapa who were murdered by the police. I would also like to mention David Josué Garcia Evangelista, Victor Manuel Lugo Ortiz, Blanca Montiel Sánchez, who were civilians also murdered by the Mexican um, uh, police. I would also like to mention Compa Cui, who was uh, shot in the head by a rubber bullet uh, outside of a demonstration and died after a year um, struggling to waken up of a coma. I would also like to mention the child uh, Tramayo Tlatiwe, who was um, playing outside a demonstration and got shot in the head by a rubber bullet. Uh, just because he was playing and, and after that uh, he died. Um, I do not have the names, but uh, I would like to mention all those thousands of people that have um, died trying to cross the border from Mexico to the United States by an um, infamous wall which is run by Israeli companies, in particular by Elbit as well as by uh, the militarization of the United States uh, which uh, affects us all. Um, yeah. Thank you. That's, 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 that, thank you. Any other names that people would like to recall? We've been thinking of the dead, but we don't. There are also people who are alive and with us who are still affected, of course. Yeah, I just want to mention my friend Hayden Burton. He was a father right, father's rights campaigner. Who he um, thing he did he they occupied the Apsley Arch, and I knew him for period of a, a couple of months he was uh, in put into Winchester prison and he apparently suicided himself but he, he wouldn't wouldn't have done that the, the family are trying but you know he, he didn't kill himself he was murdered in prison like Hayden Burton thank you well I'd like to remember somebody who's known to me personally and also somebody who's a supporter of our campaign here but who can't be with us because she's in Australia um, I'd like to, to, to mention Dwayne Brooks, who is, uh, who I, I do know, who was uh, obviously part of the, the Stephen Lawrence uh, investigation and was huge, was spied on and hugely mistreated by the police. Um, uh, and also, would like to think of Helen Steele and all of the, the women who are campaigning as part of the, the No to Spy Cops campaign. As we said earlier, Helen has been confronting uh, John Dines, who is one of the police officers uh, involved in the special demonstration squad, and who had a relationship with her for two years as an undercover officer. So again, we're thinking of all of those today who are still alive but have had their lives terribly blighted by uh, the repression that we are creating and exporting from this building uh, and from the UK. Any other names? Uh, okay. Um I'm just going to have to mention that uh, some of the activists in this country actually are being targeted as well by the police. 
Unfortunately, I know one person, we don't really want to mention his name, he's actually in prison at the moment. He was, uh, he was targeted by the police during the number, November the 5th demonstrations, and then they actually said that he was one of the ringleaders. And so they actually, well, they have, they prosecuted him, and they said if he actually pleaded guilty, so if he didn't plead guilty and he would be found guilty, he would have to go to prison for uh, six months. But if he did plead guilty, then he would, uh, he would get only three months, and then he'll be out in, within uh, six weeks. So because there's no more uh, legal aid, he did plead guilty, and he's still currently in prison. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Keep taping people, mate. That's a part of it. Uh, yeah. What's your name, Lorenzo? Sam. Raymond. I've been, been asked by the Bahrainis to share the name Syed Ahmed, who is someone killed in Bahrain there to represent the many thousands that have been killed there. Thank you. Fucking spy. Filming everyone all the time. You used to be in the army, didn't you? What's your name? Lorenzo or is it Raymond? Can we can we show respect to can we raise this after what, the demo? Respect to spies? Respect to spies? We're, in the, we're, we're talking about names of people who've been hurt and injured at the moment by police repression. And isn't it insulting that someone who works for the security services, ex army is filming this this thing, i.e. live streaming directly to the, to the people that repress it, he's filming this vigil. That's only your opinion. No facts. No, it's not facts. You have no facts. Can, can, we, can, I, can, I, can, I, can I have any more names? Any more names? Okay. All right, so we're coming to uh, the end of, of, of uh, our scheduled time here. Um, now will be the time if, if uh, we're now starting to think about next steps and how you can act to uh, stop this police repression. Uh, can I highlight Stop the Arms Fair, who are a coalition of groups and individuals who campaign against uh, arms and the sale of arms here in London, but also uh, in, in anywhere in the country and also uh, solidarity with uh, friends and colleagues in New Zealand and Paris and uh, the United States. So we, we have a kind of uh, broader network and South Korea. So if, if campaigning against arms fairs is what you'd like to do and to say no to things like Police and Security 2016 but also the Cardiff Arms Fair which is taking next pla place next week and also DSEI which takes place every two years Please do, uh, please do sign up and find your way to, um, uh, to, to, to that. I wonder, if, Kevin, would you like to mention NetPol? I'm not sure if Kevin, uh, well, Kevin. Thank you. <laughs> he's, 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 NetPol were one of the organizers of the demonstration today. Again, uh, available, uh, you can find them on via the website and via Twitter. NetPol campaign against uh, police surveillance. Uh, Kevin, do you want to say something about NetPol? Come on. I know. <laughs> Just say something about the campaign. Yeah, so the main focus of what the work that we're doing is, is obviously about defending people's right to, to assemble, but in particular, the overt mass surveillance on protesters. If you check out our website, there's lots of information, particularly on the targeting of anti-fracking campaigners, but also uh, on how you can push back against uh, ballot surveillance by trying to get information from the police about the information that they hold on you. So. You can find information um, and details about how to get involved in that campaign at netpol.org. Lovely, thank you very much. Um, Philip from London Campaign Against the Arms Trade, would you like to share some words? It's an organisation of which I am a member too. Um, so London Campaign Against Arms Trade is focused on specifically the arms trade in London. Our main focus at the moment is the sponsorship of the Transport Museum by Thales, which is like the world's 11th largest weapons manufacturer. Um, we meet uh, next Tuesday in the, in the Campaign Against Arms Trade office at Finsbury Park. Uh, we meet every month. Um, it would be great if you want to come and get involved. I've got some leaflets about what we've been doing. Wonderful, thank you. Um, as you say, people have been putting the names of their organisations, hashtags on, on there. Um, you know, if you've got a phone, take a picture of it, take a picture of the banners and that will, that will help you. You bet. Um, okay, uh, we have a shout out for, as well from one of the organisers of this demonstration, uh, Lesbians and Gays Support the Migrants. Tell us about the clear bombs. Yeah, so um, we're an organisation that's set up um, of queer people standing in solidarity with 
migrants at the moment. Uh, this morning, as part of a series of actions around the Policing and Security Conference, a group of activists glitter bombed Circo's headquarters in North London. Um, so there's photos and stuff of that online if you wanted to have a look at that on our Facebook. Also, the next thing that we've got coming up linked to that Circo are the company that won Yarswood Detention Centre and are profiting from the fact that thousands of refugees and migrants are being locked up in appalling conditions. There's lots and lots of information about the terrible treatment of the women in Yarswood. Uh, Movement for Justice are organising this Saturday. There's coaches from London. There might be tickets left. If not, they're putting on coaches from Bedford. So if you get a train up to Bedford, you can join Lesbian and Gay Support, the Migrants, Movement for Justice and thousands of other people who will be surrounding um, the detention centre in what is always like a really, really powerful and important protest. It would be great if as many of you came as possible. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm doing a, a vigil tonight from uh, midnight to uh, midday at uh, the MI5 headquarters. Uh, in the last uh, 10 years where I've been attending London protests, it seems that Thames House, Millbank, has been uh, left out of the, the protest rota. Scotland Yard, Parliament, yes, but it's an actual building you can shut down, put down the metal shutters, and uh, yeah, you can do that, a few candles, read some John le Carre books. Uh, just, just, the fuck the spies, students not spooks. Thank you very much. So. We're wrapping up now. As I say, you'll find a lot of this stuff on, on social media. You'll, if I can point you to the Stop the Arms Fair uh, Twitter account and Facebook, and also the Netpol Twitter account and Facebook. So anything that we hear about, we'll share, we'll let you know, and you can kind of get involved. It's all about kicking out the pillars of a very repressive establishment. So one final thing. Thanks so much, everyone, for coming. I um, just want to shout out a uh, campaign against arms trade. We've heard from Stop the Arms Fair um, and uh, London Cat, who do amazing work. You might have heard of the, the national campaign as well. Um, we've worked to stop arms fairs like this um, and to end the UK's complicity in repression and human rights abuses through the arms trade. Um, we know uh, that the UK is continuing to arm Saudi Arabia, even as it bombs Yemen um, in what many organisations reputably describe as international war crimes. Um, please do uh, join the campaign to stop arming Saudi. We know that Saudi Arabia are going to be represented um, at security and policing. We know they'll be represented at the Farnborough uh, Arms Fair in July. Um, I urge all of you to get involved, free cat or, or stop the arms fair um, in, in challenging that. We saw amazing scenes in September um, at Dicey where we disrupted the flow of the arms fair. We stood and challenged power and ensured that delivery of weapons couldn't get into the arms fair on a daily basis. And what we were saying then um, and what we are saying now um, is that uh, at arms fairs, war and repression starts. And if it starts there, um, we can stop it there. So I'd like all of you to join me briefly in a, a, a little chant, um, uh, which is sometimes a little hard to follow, but uh, we'll, 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 we'll do our best. So um, war starts here. Let's stop it here. Repression starts here. Let's stop it here. War starts here. Let's stop it here. Repression starts here. Let's stop it here. War starts here. Let's stop it here. War starts here. Let's stop it here. Repression starts here. Let's stop it here. Together we can stop war and repression at the source like this. Join Stop the Arms Trade. Join Campaign Against Arms Trade. And take part in more events like this. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody, you've been amazing. Give yourselves a round of applause. You're giving yourself a round of applause, that's great. Thank you everybody. All the best. Okay. Okay guys, thank you so much. And yeah, I'll see you guys later on. That was good. Thank you, good watching, thank you guys.